Hello, everyone. Um, I am Dr. Jennifer Frankovich. I'm a pediatric rheumatologist at Stanford. I direct the Immune Behavioral Health Clinic and Research Program. Um, and I have with me today Ayan Mandel, who is studying blood brain barrier um, in PANS and will be soon studying it in our autism deterioration samples. And then I also have with me today Noor Hussein. Both are PhDs. Um, and Noor is studying healing mechanisms. Um, she's in particular going to uh, talk about T regulatory cells that help control inflammation. So these, um, this is where we get all of our funding, mostly um, foundation supports and um, generous donors. And then um, the, the research you're hearing about today comes from Betsy Mellon's lab. And uh, she has also received some research grants um, from companies, but it's unrelated to today's uh, uh, data that we're going to present. So just quickly, both PANS and PANDAS are sudden onset disorders involving OCD, tics, eating restriction. Um, many kids come after the opportunity to detect strep. Um, so we don't know if they are a strep triggered case, but we follow them carefully. So if they are clearly a strep triggered triggered case and they have OCD and tics, we we call it pandas or we call it post strep pans. If we're unclear of the trigger, we still follow, we treat, we use our you know kind of best. Um, methods for understanding what the triggers are, um, but not all cases are triggered by strep, but we think the majority are. Um, so here's the specific criteria for PAN, sudden severe onset OCD and eating restriction, along with two other sudden onset comorbid symptoms, um, anxiety, sensory dysregulation, so light, sound, pain, amplification, motor abnormalities, including handwriting deterioration, motoric hyperactivity, oftentimes a behavior regression, um, deterioration in cognitive functioning, um, mood, emotional lability, depression, um, and urinary symptoms, and severe sleep disturbances. Um, so this is what happens in a, a flare or relapse. Um, you know, although only two symptoms are required, um, most kids have five or six comorbid symptoms. So this, these kids really become quite dysfunctional after um, strep infections and sometimes other infections. So this is what we think is the mechanism that these kids have some underlying immune predisposition because obviously not all kids that get strep or mycoplasma or COVID have a deterioration. So there's an immune predisposition and then the kids get an infection and that causes a systemic and vascular inflammatory response, including complement activation. And then through that inflammatory response is what we think leads to the blood brain barrier disruption. And Dr. Um, Mondell is working hard to try to figure out exactly what the mechanisms are so that we can come up with, with ways to help, um, you know, sort of protect the brain from that blood brain barrier disruption. We've also start starting to understand some of the autoantibodies um, involved in, in PANS and PANDAS. Um, but it's not all about the autoantibodies, right? There's also brain homing monocytes, there's cytokines, there's other immune mediators. So um, we're really trying to characterize the whole bit. And then that inflammatory response we think leads to basal ganglia inflammation, altered neuronal signaling, microglial activation, and potentially vasculopathy, which I won't, I won't talk about all of this today, but maybe at a, a future update. But the other interesting thing is that this systemic vascular inflammatory response also leads to arthritis and other autoimmune diseases. So in our kids with more chronic symptoms, we're really looking for evidence of something systemic going on that we can target because we think the inflammation that's perpetuated in the body also contributes to the milieu that is disrupting the blood-brain barrier. So in our classic PANS patients, but we've also seen this in kids with autism deteriorations, is we see this um, inflammation where tendons and ligaments insert onto bones. So this is a knee, and you can see that 
these borders of the kneecap and the patella ligament insertion can be painful. We also see this in family members of our kids with PANS and autism deterioration. So the first MTP, that big joint on the toe, we often see um, inflammation in the heel. We will have our kids walk on their heels and tell us if that hurts their heels um, around the hip bones too and the greater trochanter. So these are all places that we see. We can also see some kids evolve into having a spondyloarthritis. And so they get inflammation. This is the pelvis bones in, into their sacroiliac joints. And then we also see um, back inflammation. And even the spinous processes can be tender on the kiddos. So if you suspect your kid has this, press on those little bumps on their back and see if they have inflammation there, because that can guide um, treatments for that type of inflammation. And then we also see um, sometimes the small joints in the fingers and toes involved. Um, we, we suspect that some of these kids, oops, sorry, some of these kids evolve into psoriatic arthritis. We also see sometimes these actually in like maybe 20% of our kids, these little pits in the nails. And that's a sign that the arthritis is related to psoriasis, which we know psoriasis can be related to strep. Um, so, and then sometimes we just see abnormal nails, which um, give us also a clue that this might be a psoriatic nail. But anyways, all these clues help us understand what type of anti-inflammatories to use. So for our classic kid with PANS and they present, you know, between five and 10 and with their first episode, by the time they get to like 16 or so, 40% of them have arthritis. Um, so it's, it's not a rare thing in this population. So the good news is, is that our patients, all, all of us, all bodies can self-heal, can self-regulate inflammation. So we, we, I'll show you a figure later that a lot of these relapses can resolve on their own or with very little medicine, just like NSAIDs. And we think it's because um, in part, the body has the ability to produce anti-inflammatory cells and has anti-inflammatory mechanisms. And uh, Dr. Hussein today is going to talk to you about um, the role of T regulatory cells in patients. So these are the observed trajectories we see in PANS and some of our kids with autism. Um, we see these relapses, which can last three to four months, but if it's like a strep triggered and we clear the strep and we give NSAIDs, they can go back to a very good baseline, um, right? And then they can go a year without a, another flare. But we have some kids with every episode, they their baseline worsens and their flares are a little bit longer, six to nine months. So these are the kids that we think need more help getting the inflammation under control and back to a good baseline. This primary persistent course is very rare. So at the first episode, they just don't get better. We think these kids are the ones with more clear autoimmunity and we should probably be treating them more aggressively. And then this course is secondary persistent. So these are the kids that have a few episodes and then they go into a chronic episode. And again, this probably reflects uh, of a more um, autoimmune response, wh whereas these are probably more of the innate immune system. So this is the percent of kids that come to our clinic that we think are strep triggered. So these are all the kids with pan with you know just a sudden deterioration. 57% of the time, we're pretty sure that they have strep um, because we culture it or they have high strep titers. And then about 25% of the time, we're strongly suspicious because maybe there was a family member with strep right before the kid deteriorated. So all in all, it's about 82% that we think are strep triggered. Um, so we monitor these kids very carefully. And then 18% of the kids, we just have no clue what the trigger was, or maybe it was post-flu or post-COVID or something else. Um, so the basal ganglia are is what we think is targeted in PANS, and the, uh, the basal ganglia uh, um, play a, a big role in governing movements, mood, emotion, behavior, procedural learning, cognition. Um, so when there is inflammation, um, this disrupts the normal role. And we think inflammation can also cause injury. Injury, we can heal from injury. Patients can heal from injury, but they also need rehabilitation to, to, to help build back pathways. 
So that includes CBT, you know, PT, OT, lots of things. Um, so this is, I'm not going to go over these details, but these are four imaging studies um, that show that the basal ganglia are likely the, the target structure. And this was the most recent study that we published um, showing microstructural changes in the basal ganglia. So again, it's the inflammation probably caused injury, um, and these kids need to heal from injury, which we know they can. And then there are three studies which indicate that these patients have movements during REM sleep. So during REM sleep, a child, all humans actually are paralyzed because you don't act out your dreams. Um, so it's abnormal if a patient has movements, laughing, moaning, hand stereopathies, or atonia, meaning they don't relax. And you can pick this up on, I mean, oftentimes parents will kind of pick this up. They can like see that their child is probably acting out a dream. Um, or we, we have our kids do sleep studies and you put probes on all the limbs, including the chin. And if the chin doesn't relax, we know that this is happening. This is a sign that another sign that the basal ganglia are involved. Um, these, these movements during REM sleep is a predictor of Parkinson's disease in adults. So we take this very seriously. And this is why we're working so hard to figure out all the mechanisms which can help heal these kids because we don't want them to grow up and have issues with um, Parkinson's or related conditions. So we've also seen just on physical exam, you can see that these kids have signs of basal ganglia disruption, including this positive glabellar tap reflex, which usually goes away in infancy, but we see it in 22% of our of our kids. And this is also a predictor of Parkinson's. We see abnormal tongue movements. We see a milkmaid's grip, creaform movements, spooning, overflow movements. So all in all, about 80% to 92% of our kids have at least one basal ganglia sign when they come to us in a deterioration. So just more evidence that the basal ganglia are probably involved. These are sort of some other neurodevelopmental groups. I just wanted to point out this group, youth with ASD, 19% also have a positive glabellar tap. And 27% have milkmaid's grip, tongue movements, other signs of motor impersistence. And again, this is like what you see in Sydenham's chorea, the po another post-strep condition. So youth with SC, Sydenham's chorea. So these basal ganglia signs are not unique to PANS or Sydenham's chorea. You know, we see this in other uh, neurodevelopmental, um, you know, populations. So I think these, all these kids, we should be studying very carefully. And then this is just one of the antibodies that has been discovered to be associated with PANS. These are antibodies that target cholinergic interneurons. So we see those in healthy kids. So you can see here, these are healthy kids. Here are kids with PANDAS. So healthy kids have them. PANDAS kids have it just a little bit more. Um, so if they're really causing a problem, it's because they're getting into the brain. It's because the blood-brain barrier is, is disrupted. And that's why Ayaan's work or Dr. Mondale's work is so important. And we do see, we, we have done LPs in a subset of our patients. Only a third of the patients have a slightly elevated protein or um, what we call an albumin quotient. But it's so slight. Most of these kids would never even come close to meeting criteria for autoimmune encephalitis or any of these other, um, you know, sort of clear inflammatory brain conditions. But we think so we think the blood brain barrier is disrupted in a very localized place. So not enough to cr cause gross abnormalities in the in the cerebral spinal fluid, but enough that that it's causing symptoms, letting antibodies into a vulnerable 